Good morning, everyone. I missed being here for the regional you had a few weeks ago, so I'm glad to be here today. Last time I was here, I acknowledged my brother Len sitting over here. He was such a strong, positive Christian influence on me when he was a university student in Dunedin and when I was a teenager, a high school student at that time. So thanks again, Len, for the influence you were on me then, and what a delight to catch up with you again at this stage of our lives as old guys. Well, you anyway, not me, but. I remember quite a few years ago when I was a student at Avondale College, sitting in a Vesper service, and a song was sung that is with me to this day. And the chorus of that song has these words. The Lord is coming. Are you ready? The Lord is coming. Are you ready? Would your heart be right if he came tonight? The Lord is coming. Are you ready? And if my memory serves me correct, the people who sang that are some names you might recognize. Chester Stanley, Lyle Heiss, Roger Vince, and Andy Kingston. The Lord is coming. Are you ready? It's an important question. Do you agree? Let's go back one step. The Lord is coming. Do you agree? And it doesn't take much for us to recognize the signs that that coming is sure and certain. I cannot imagine this planet lasting much longer. Can you? But with a long or short, the reality is that we have a Lord and that Lord is coming back to this planet. And like Ernest Shackleton going back to get his men from Elephant Island, Christ is coming back to get us, to get you and me and take us to be where he is so that where he is, we may be also. Is that foundational belief a strong one for you today, yes or no? Not very sure, yes or no? It is. it is a reality, isn't it? That we have a Christ, and that Christ is returning to take us to be where he is. I want with all my heart to be ready not tomorrow, not a week from now, not a month from now, not next year. I want to be ready today. You too? Now is the day of salvation. If you are hearing God's invitation today, heed that invitation. Do not put it off until tomorrow. And you have that desire for others around you too. I know that you do. Jesus said to his disciples shortly before his death, recorded in Matthew 24, Be ye therefore, finish it for me, ready. Be ye therefore ready. I looked up that Greek word ready, and this is what it means. should be coming up on the screen here. It means a number of things. Read them with me, would you? It means this. Ready? Fit. I'm not hearing you. Ready? Fit, adjusted, prepared, poised, in order, and done. Think about each of those. I think about the word fit, and I'm reminded of an athlete who's training for the Olympics. And when the Olympics come, that person has trained so hard, so long, so faithfully, that he or she is fit for the challenge that's coming. Adjusted. I think of people like... Uh, Mary Ann, with your, your back problems and how you go to an osteopath perhaps and, and if you have some problem with your back, you get what? An adjustment. Have you been adjusted for the kingdom? Are you ready from the point of view of being adjusted in your mental attitude and your whole being toward the soon return of Jesus Christ? Prepared. As I stand before you this morning, I have spent some hours in prayer for this service this morning. I've spent some hours studying the Word for this sermon this morning. 
I have not simply wandered in here unprepared. I am prepared for this under the Holy Spirit and by the Word. We must be prepared for the coming of Christ. Poised. I think of a strike force in the military. They have trained. They have uh, instructed themselves. They have communicated among each other as to exactly what they plan to do. And they are simply waiting for the command from above. Now, strike, shoot, attack, whatever. But they are poised and they are ready. Are you poised and ready for Jesus right now? The words in order. When someone is approaching the end of his life, he sets his affairs what? In order. He wants to make it easy for his family who remains. Things are put in place. Are things in your life in order today for the, cru for the return of Jesus, your Savior? The word done. I have to think of uh, a loaf of bread or a cake in the oven. <laughs> you know how you, you stick your finger in it or you stick a fork in it? Is it done yet? And I kind of have this picture of God looking at me and saying, Ed, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Done yet? <laughs> and sometimes I feel I have to respond, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. I think I'm ready, but deep down I wonder if I really am. And that's the question that I want to address this morning. You know that in the context of Matthew 24, Jesus said there was a time when people weren't ready. Which time was that? The time of the flood. Noah preached for over a hundred years. He preached that the world was going to be destroyed. He said to the people, he pled with them, please, be ready. He said, the boat is ready. God is ready. Please, people, get ready and come into the ark so that your lives may be preserved. But the time came and the people were not ready. The people laughed at Noah. The people were too busy with their ordinary lives to be ready when the flood came. And so the flood took them all away. When Jesus himself appeared on the stage of history, God was ready. It was the fullness of time in which Jesus came. Salvation was ready. Salvation was accomplished on the cross. Jesus said, it is done. It is finished. It is prepared. Salvation is poised and in order. But the people were not ready for the most part. The church of Jesus' time was not fit, not adjusted, not prepared, not poised, not in order, not done. The church of the time did not receive Jesus. He came to his own people, but his own people received him not. That is a sad commentary, isn't it? What if Jesus were to come today? Would the same thing be said? He came to his own people, but his own people were not ready. His own people were not poised and fit and adjusted and in order. That would be sad, wouldn't it? It's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for you. You know, in Seventh-day Adventist history back in uh, 1888, there was a general conference session in the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA. And at that general conference session, it almost seemed as if something momentous was going to happen. Throughout the 19th century, God had been raising up people of faith, people like Hudson Taylor and George Mueller, Florence Nightingale, many, many others, David Livingstone, Adoniram Judson, through many agencies, uh, William Miller, through many agencies it seemed as though God was saying, ready now? Because I am. I'm sending my gospel out to all the world. Nations around the world are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and they are responding. 
There was a tremendous missionary movement in the 19th century throughout the world. Are you aware of that? And it seemed as though God was marshalling the events of history to prepare a people to receive the everlasting gospel in its fullness and its power and to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that right then, after that general conference session in 1888, it seems as I study the subject and study the context of history, that God would have, could have, was ready to pour out the gospel, pour out the Holy Spirit, empower a people to share the everlasting gospel throughout the world so that Jesus would quickly come. In fact, there was one there who was observing it. Her name was Ellen White, a founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she wrote about this afterward. And it is extremely disturbing to read her description of what happened. She says that the two young men, Wagoner and Jones, who presented the everlasting gospel, were treated as spitefully as Christ was treated when he was put to death on the cross. She says that the Spirit of God was insulted. She says that the spirit of rebellion and rejection that rose up against Wagoner and Jones at that time was equal to the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram back in the wilderness wanderings of the Jews. Remember that incident? And so a precious opportunity was lost. God showed up. God came. The gospel was preached. The Holy Spirit was poised to be poured out in abundance, but the people weren't ready. The people didn't want it. The people felt threatened. They said, oh, this new teaching about the gospel, this is not one of the old landmarks, quote, unquote. And Ellen White said, they have no idea what the old landmarks are. She says, if there's one landmark that stands above all others, it is the pure gospel of Christ our Lord who died on Calvary for you and for me. She says, that's the chief landmark. If they're talking about the old landmarks, let them gather around the cross. Let them look into the tear-stained, blood-stained face of Jesus and say, I'm ready now, Jesus. I'm ready now. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of my wilderness journey. I'm tired of not yet being in the new kingdom. Ready now, Lord. Please come. Do the work in my life that you want to do. Let your gospel flood through me. Let your Holy Spirit flow through me. I place myself as an instrument of yours for the sharing of the everlasting gospel throughout the world that Jesus might soon come. That's what God wanted back then. But the people weren't ready. How many years do you think we have to go before we're ready? I mean, would it be one or ten or fifty or a hundred or five hundred or a thousand? What, what's the holdup? What's the problem? Is God ready? Yes or no? Yes. He's ready. The cup of iniquity on this planet is full. Do you agree? How much more full do you think it could get? But my friends, there's another cup that's full, and that's the cup of blessing surrounding the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the cup of blessing that represents the Holy Spirit and is outpouring do you also see that that cup is full? And are you ready as a people and individually this morning to say, Lord, pour out the cup of blessing. Pour out the gospel. 
pour out the Holy Spirit and make me a part of that final movement that takes the gospel to all the world. Would you like to say yes to God on that? I hope so. I hope so. I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of tired of things down here, aren't you? I mean, we've got lots of good stuff, especially living in New Zealand. We've got beautiful beaches and forests and birds and ocean life. We have friends. We have nice churches. We have, most of us have nice vehicles. So much going for us. But even so, can you watch the news today without tears? Can you watch the news today without agony over the condition in the world? Jesus is ready to come. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that he's looking desperately around the world today for a people who are ready for him. A people who say, enough is enough. Let's not repeat the mistake of those at the flood. Let's not repeat the mistake of those when Jesus came to earth. Let's not repeat the mistake of those gathered in Adventist context in 1888. Let's now make sure that we individually and together are ready. Ready for the gospel. Ready for the Holy Spirit. Ready for the word of life. Ready to take the gospel to all the world. Fit, adjusted, prepared, poised in order, and done. Are you with me on this this morning, friends? You know, when Jesus was approaching his crucifixion, he said to his disciples, hey guys, I want you to, I want you to go into the city. Remember, that was a dangerous thing to do. I want you to go into the city, and when you get inside the city gates, you will see someone who is carrying a jar of water. I want you to follow that man who's carrying the jar of water and he will take you to a room, an upper room. There in that room I want to meet with you to celebrate the inauguration of the new covenant in my blood. And when you get to that room, I want you to check it out and I believe you will find that it is prepared and ready. I am so glad that while the church was not prepared and ready, at least there was a room that was prepared and ready. At least one room prepared and ready for Jesus. And it makes me make the application to my own heart and mind. Is my heart and my mind prepared and ready for Jesus today? There's a story about uh, a traveler who came across an, a garden in Switzerland. And he saw there was a beautiful place and it seemed very quiet and peaceful. And he, and he went up to the gate and he knocked on the gate and, and a, a gardener opened the gate uh, and, and said hello. And, and the traveler said, what a beautiful garden. The traveler said, yes, it is beautiful. And the traveler said, um, well, how long have you been here? And the, the uh, gardener said, about 24 years. And and he said, well, you have everything certainly in great shape. He said, does your master come here very often? And the gardener said, uh, well, he's been here four times in the last 24 years. Really? Well, when was he last here? Twelve years ago. Well, then who comes? Almost nobody. I am almost always alone. Well, who pays your salary? Oh, my, my master's agent who lives in my land. But he comes here often? No, he's never been here. And yet you have everything in perfect order as if your master was coming tomorrow. And the gardener replied, No, sir, as if he was coming today. 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 There's a prayer we sometimes pray that I really don't like. <laughs> I, I like prayers, 
and I appreciate prayers, but there's one that I really don't like. I always have a problem with it. And it's that prayer we pray when we say, O oh Lord, when you come, might we be found ready. Now, I know the intention is good, so don't feel bad if you've prayed that prayer even today. <laughs> but think about it. If I am waiting until Jesus comes to be ready, I think I'm going to be in pretty big trouble, don't you? It'll be too late then. The door of the ark will have closed before them. No, it's not, Lord, when you come, might I be found ready. Rather, it is today, Lord Jesus, I believe that under the cross and under your blood, I am counted as ready. Last time I was here, I preached on that marvelous text, John 5 and verse 24. Do you remember what that verse says? Jesus said, if you, two things, if you hear my voice and you believe my Father who sent me, then you have eternal life. You will not come into condemnation. You have already passed from death to life. You see, in the first part of this message, I've been talking about one particular kind of readiness, the readiness of the heart. That's a critical readiness. Your heart must be prepared and ready for Jesus. It's your privilege and your choice. But the second part of that message is perhaps even more important. And the second part is simply this, that under the cross of Christ, I may claim my readiness now. Are you with me on that? It's one thing for me to want to be ready, but I must know how to be ready. And friends, the way you can be ready today for Jesus is to know that you stand today firmly under the banner of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Your being a church member is wonderful, but your being a church member does not constitute readiness for heaven. Your knowing all the wonderful beliefs that we hold precious is, is important, but your understanding of all those beliefs does not constitute your readiness for heaven, right? Never forget that the people who crucified Jesus and sent soldiers to smash his legs so that he would die before sundown so that the Sabbath wouldn't be broken knew all about the beliefs. They were, quote-unquote, perfect in their belief. They were, quote-unquote, perfect in their church attendance and membership. But their hearts were far from God. They, their readiness lay in the forms and rituals of religion. Their readiness lay in the church. My friends, church is wonderful. I believe in church. I love church. But friends, my readiness lies only in Jesus and His cross and His intercession for me in heaven above. Let's never forget that. Would you like to be ready for Jesus today? Find your readiness under the banner of the cross and under the righteousness of Jesus. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. In other words, it is fit, it is adjusted, it is prepared, it is poised, it is in order, it is done. We talk about readiness for heaven, but friends, let's remember that the essence of that readiness is not within us. I cannot make myself ready and fit for Jesus. I can have a willingness for Him by His righteousness to make me ready and fit and prepared. That's what I can do. And so I have chosen Jesus Christ as my Savior. 
as my atonement, as my sacrifice. Referring back to our friend Ellen White again, she said this, two years after 1888, she wrote a letter from Australia about that sad occasion in 1888. You can read these uh, uh, wonderful collection of comments she made about the gospel in, in a manuscript called Manuscript 36, dated 1890. And in that document, she says this, along with many other wonderful things. She says, If you are right with Christ today, can you guess what's coming? You are ready if Christ should come today. Don't you love that? And it really is echoing what Jesus said in John 5, 24, right? It really is echoing what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 1. There is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My readiness is in Christ. My readiness is not in Ed Gallagher. My readiness is not in church. My readiness is not in an endless round of religious rituals. My readiness is not even simply in the reading of the Word or in prayer. Those are important. But as Jesus said to the people of His time, you search the Scriptures, you pray all over the place, yet you fail to come to Me that you might have life. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. There, friends, is the dividing line. The dividing line is at the cross. Am I under the blood? That's my readiness. Am I under the blood? That comment again. If you are right with Christ today, you are ready if Christ should come today. Would you let that sink deep? <laughs> Would you do that favor for me? And for yourself and for God, let that sink deep. In fact, I'd like to change the wording slightly to make it personal like this. If I am right with Christ today, I am ready if Christ should come today. And I'd like you to say that with me because I think that's a wonderful thing to memorize. So once again, it will be, if I am right with Christ today, I am ready if Christ should come today. You ready to say it together now with me? One, two, three. If I am right with Christ today, I am ready if Christ should come today. And I see a number of children here. Whether you're young or old or somewhere in between, this message is for you. If you're only 9 or 10 or 15 or something or 19, if you are right with Christ today, you're ready if Christ should come today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wish I'd known that when I was 8 or 9 or 10 or 15 or even 19. <laughs> it took a while. I guess I'm a slow learner when it comes to salvation and the heart of what God is really about. If I am right with Christ today, I am ready if Christ should come today. And then, as you know, it's my privilege. It's my privilege knowing that I stand ready before God through Christ. It's my privilege then to take that blessing and let it envelop my whole life. There is no genuine Christian who says, oh, that's nice, I've received the righteousness of Jesus, so now I'll just carry on with life as normal. If you receive Christ Jesus, you can never carry on with life as normal. Life with normal is opposed to Jesus. Life as normal is against God. Life as normal kills the church and destroys the world. But the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness which is firmly secured through the sacrifice of Jesus is a righteousness that gets deep inside. It's a righteousness that springs up like a mustard seed and grows within me and bears fruit from my life. The righteousness of Jesus is not some theoretical legal standing alone. It is rather something that completely envelops me and lifts me up into the very courts of heaven even while I make my way through this stinking world. 
in Christ. In Christ. About 240 times in the New Testament, there are direct or indirect references to the subject of being in Christ. You want to have your Christian life come on fire? You want to really understand what it means to be ready for Jesus to come? Study your New Testament on the theme of what it means to be in Christ. Begin with John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, where he pours out his heart to the Father and says, I pray that even, Father, as you are in me and I am in you, I pray, Father, that we will be in them and they will be in us. What a concept. What a concept. That we may be in God as the Son is in the Father through that union which the Holy Spirit gives us by faith. What a joy. Would your heart be right if he came tonight? I think there's every reason for your answer to be yes. Correct? There's a story about St. Francis of Assisi. He was, um, as an old man, someone came to visit him, and uh, he was hoeing his garden. And the visitor said to St. Francis of Assisi, said, if you could know that tonight you were going to die, what would you do with the rest of your day? And do you know what he replied? He replied, I would finish hoeing my garden. <laughs> It brings out something important, doesn't it? It brings out the understanding that when I am right with Christ, when I have received the perfect covering of the righteousness of Jesus, that there is a peace. There is a profound sense that what I am doing with my life right now is squarely within the will of God that I am not at the far edges of the will of God. I am right in the center of the will of God. As I wake up in the morning, lift my mind to heaven, commit myself into his hands for the day, pray for my loved ones, pray for this country, pray for the world, pray for the church. And as I ask God, please, God, use me to bless somebody today that places me in the center of of the will of God. What a peaceful place. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? To be in the center of God's will each day. To know that what I am doing throughout the course of the day is according to His plan, that it glorifies Him, that in some small way it does something to advance the kingdom of God on earth. That is a joy you do not get from Hollywood, right? That is a joy you don't get from all the, the toys and the pleasures, many of them legitimate and fine. That is a joy that comes straight from heaven. And what a joy it is. I would finish hoeing my garden. <laughs> That's readiness, isn't it? I would finish enjoying the Sabbath. I would finish enjoying the fellowship. I would finish living my life as I've been living it for the last so many years, talking with God often, studying His Word, sharing a blessing, dropping a word for Christ, sending an email to encourage someone who's discouraged, making a phone call to pray with someone who's sick, going to knock on a door of someone who doesn't yet know Christ, but is in desperate need of Him, that's how I would finish my day. Ready. Ready. Ready in heart. 
and ready because of the cross. I recommend readiness for Jesus today. We're going to sing a song which will come up on the screen now. Are you ready for Jesus to come? I hope you have your personal answer. We give enthusiastic praise to you, Lord Jesus, that in Christ our answer is yes. As one of the old-time reformers said, when I look to myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look to Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. Thank you, Father God, for counting us ready in Christ. If we have made our simple commitment and confession of Him. Thank you that it's our privilege to come to the cross. Say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. Cover me completely with your righteousness. Receive me completely into your presence and hold me close to your side from this day forward until I see you face to face. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we take those simple steps, we are indeed ready for you to come. And thank you, Lord, that that readiness might grow and flourish in practical living all through our journey until we see you face to face. I pray, Lord, that you will keep each one of us here from the, the cynicism and the worldliness of those at the time of Noah, that you will keep us from the self-satisfaction and ritualism that characterized the people in the church of Jesus' time. I pray, Lord, that you will redeem us and save us from the skepticism and criticism and division 
of that time in 1888 when your people had such a wonderful opportunity, but by and large turned it down. Thank you that your love remains strong for your people. Thank you that you do not give up on your people. But year after year, decade after decade, your hands are stretched out still. And I pray, Lord Jesus, in the quietness of this moment, at the end of this worship time, that each person here, old, young, and in between, will renew his or her personal commitment of readiness for you. May it be done, Lord, by your Holy Spirit working in each of us right in this moment. I pray, Lord, that not a single person in this room right now will escape the appeal of your Spirit. And whether it's a first-time step in a genuine manner or a renewal of a commitment made long ago, but perhaps a commitment that dragged a little bit in the dust, whatever the character, Lord, of the commitment now on the part of each of us, I know that you are accepting it with joy in heaven. I know, Lord Jesus, as you are high-fiving the angels and saying, yes, 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 I love it when my people come back in readiness for me. And we will love it, Lord Jesus, when you come back and find us ready. When you come back and say, enter now into the full, final, and complete joy of your Lord. We look forward to that. In the meantime, Lord, may we hold the banner high and present the righteousness of Jesus faithfully and energetically that the world may be brought to accountability and to salvation, as many as possible. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. May the rest of the day and the rest of our lives be under the in Christ blessing held by faith in your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.